Every time I clean my house, there's an elephant in the room. A box I dare not touch. But no, it shouldn't really have a place in my home. A sealed crate of memories which I've kept locked away for the better part of a decade. But I've decided to open Pandora's box. Whether it contains clues to solve the mystery of my childhood or bring back the pain of my youth is yet to be determined. But it's an endeavour I've put off until now. The box is simply labelled James and Martin. I gently opened the long-rested packaging tape, the delicately thin material being a weak security, yet it held sealed all this time from the fear of what's inside. I found the thing which will spearhead my investigation. My old childhood hard drive. It was slow to boot up. It's already apparent from the screech as it sprang its age was already apparent from the screech as it sprang to life. It whirred away until a folder showed up, listing its contents. It was as organised as one could imagine a ten-year-old was capable of. A series of nonsensical folders, and nothing named correctly. It wasn't easy to decipher files that were named a random string of numbers and letters, we rushed to save the files as quickly as possible so we could view them, not caring about the organising afterwards. Luckily, a lot of muscle memory was still in place, and I navigated the drive with relative ease, though I couldn't imagine how a stranger would fare. I flicked through a folder of pictures and videos. There were a lot of admittedly embarrassing files. Pictures of us recreating scenes we saw on TV, James, Martin and I were the Ninja Turtles one year for Halloween. We never had a fourth member so we just carried a Leonardo figure with us. To us, that counted. There was a video next to the picture of us running around screaming quotes from the show. Seeing us happy brought a sting of pain. It's true what they say. You look back on the moments you cried and laugh. You look back on the moments you laughed and cry. But these cringeworthy moments of our youth isn't what brings painful memories. It's another folder of files that start things off. The videos of us chasing a monster. Before I hit the series of videos that we documented, there was a precursor picture of us all together. I remember propping the camera on a wall. We didn't have a tripod at the time. I was in the middle, to my left was James, looking adventurous and ready, to my right was Martin, looking content in our company. This was the ragtag group we called the Hunters. This picture was supposed to be the cover photo of our adventure, the one we'd be signing when we were famous. This was the last happy photo we ever had together. Growing up, we didn't have much. We lived in rural nowhere with nothing to do, so we made our own adventures. We would trail in the nearby woods, skirting the edge of town. We made several dens, where we'd convene together and play. Our parents didn't mind. They drilled into us many safety lessons, and we were content knowing the safe reputation of our little hamlet. They also knew the reputation of how little there was to do in our town. I think they figured by trailing the woods, we were both keeping fit and staying out of trouble. You'll be surprised how many kids got into drugs simply out of boredom. What they didn't know was that we had a common goal. We were obsessed with TV shows about unsolved mysteries, UFO experiences and cryptid sightings. We came to the mutual agreement to join the hunt, hence our group name, The Hunters. This just culminated in us sitting in the woods hoping to spot something while we played. We never got serious until my 10th birthday. James was the oldest in our group, 
having his birthday first in our group. This gave him an unspoken authority, though looking back, we were all the same age really. There was only a few months difference, but back then, those months made a huge difference. Turning 10, it meant I was finally the same age as everyone else. I was one of the latest in my class when it came to birthdays, always making me the kid of the group. It was a small gathering, but I remember having fun. We all played games, ran by our parents. I think we had it where each parent thought up a game, each with a prize. We then ate a meal, a potluck from each family. Afterwards, I opened my presents. Martin and James gave some of their toys that I liked, which I adored, knowing we all never had much to give. The rest of my presents were either hand-me-downs or from a charity shop. The one present that stood out was from a distant uncle, signed A. Carlson. When I opened it, the whole room lit up. I had never met this uncle before. He was from a side of the family we never spoke of. Whenever I'd bring it up, the subject would often get changed, or I'd be told I wasn't old enough to know about it. The present was a camera. Though it was secondhand, which was apparent by its condition, we were all thrilled, more so than my parents and theirs expected. I think to them, they thought it was probably going to get a few days use, before we gave up on it and moved on to playing with our regular toys, which was apparent by their sceptical looks at the gift. They probably saw how low quality and old it was, probably one of the earliest models of digital cameras out there, but we unanimously all saw what the camera meant. We now had a tool to catch a picture of a cryptid. We all agreed to only film whatever was necessary, but being 10, we never stuck to this ideal. We ended up just filming everything, big trees, jokes we just thought up, skits with our toys, stunts to show off, strange flowers. We'd sometimes just film us talking as we walked through the woods. When we got home, we charged the camera and transfer all the files. Then throughout the evening, we'd laugh at all the pictures and skip through the videos. Skipping through them now, it's a surreal feeling seeing them again, James and Martin. I never got to see them grow up, so to me, they will always look like that in my head. Seeing them so young made me feel invigorated with youth, and for a fleeting moment, I was there, walking with them in the woods, laughing at the funny shape of the trees we found, or doing silly voices to each other. I eventually stopped skipping through the files and let them play out. Because I was often the cameraman, it gave the sensation that I was there with them, walking the all too familiar trails, sun blaring down between the pines and leaves. When I closed my eyes, listening to the rustle of our footsteps, the visceral crunch of the dry leaves and branches, I can almost smell the fresh nature surrounding me. Sensations I'll never forget. At first, our parents were right. After days of not catching a goblin, ghost, UFO or Bigfoot on camera, we started to lose a bit of interest. A reality slowly settled in that maybe this task wasn't going to be as easy as we thought. But we were filled with a childish innocence that we were special. And because we believed in our cause, we were going to succeed some Saturday morning cartoon logic. Deep down though, we started to form doubt. Still, we were having fun. There was an element of enjoyment when we filmed our experiences. It's easy to forget a funny comment in passing, but at times we could just pull up the footage and remember the joke, told fresh in the moment for a second time to savour. 
It was when we were looking for a funny comment James made, skipping through the video of us being goofy while walking around, when we accidentally paused the video as the camera was turning. It was only caught in a frame or two, but there it was, distorted by the terrible quality of the motion blur, behind a bush in the distance was the clear silhouette of a figure. We ran it back, frame by frame, our eyes practically touching the monitor. We didn't believe it. In our minds, we did it. We had genuinely caught a cryptid on camera. This reignited our passions and all our focus poured into our group's original passion. From then on, we set our goals to catching this figure. We never knew that the figure had the same goal about us. I didn't know how much I was going to get into this project, but here I am again, digging through the files of my old childhood hard drive with a fine toothed comb. I figured there was only going to be a few videos at most, that as kids we probably deleted a lot of them to save space. But many still exist. Not just videos, but pictures too. Way too many to go through in a day. There was a folder named School. This was a file we made for the days we snuck the camera to, well, school. We'd take various photos of strange things we'd see there. As hunters of the unknown, vigilant as always to document anything bizarre, which being in school, there were many. Soaked tissues thrown into the bathroom ceiling, documented. The torn off tail of a squirrel in a field, we snapped that. The mysteries didn't end. How about two teachers from different departments talking? We snuck a photo of that. In hindsight, was it suspicious? Of course not, they were just talking, but we were skeptical of everything. During school, we never paid much attention. We weren't exactly failing every class, but we weren't exactly excelling either. We flew under the radar of the teacher's eye, not labelled as particularly gifted, but not labelled as troublemakers either. The perfect definition of the middle kids. This was the same socially. We didn't hang out with the cool kids, nor the losers. We just hung out with each other. The closest thing to popular we ever felt was the time I actually got a love letter for Valentine's Day. It was a kind of attention neither of us were used to, nor were we prepared for. I ended up never chasing it up, purely out of a nervous fear. There's still a picture of it though, documented in the school folder. Looking at it, it wasn't written in the neatest handwriting, but it spoke words of pure love. It was very eloquently written using some words and metaphors I never learnt until much later in life. Phrases describing how they cherished me, and how I was the brightest star they wanted to stare at in dark nights. But in the end, we were at an age where play ranked above smelly girls. Our escapades always took precedent over social matters. We were dedicated, never wanting to let each other down. When we were on break, We'd meet up and share notes. It wasn't to exchange test answers or upcoming... It wasn't to exchange test answers or upcoming subject notes. That would have been smart to do. No, we constantly came up with plans to catch our local cryptid. Flicking through the school photo album, there's still some documented scribbles we saved for later use. Each plan oozing with naive optimism. What I found wasn't just plans though, there were some study notes. 
theories on what the figure may be. These ideas ranged from a Wendigo to Bigfoot. Our minds went lucid with the possibilities that lay before us. But we eventually unanimously settled on one thing. Whether it was naivety or hubris, we had it in our heads that what we found was something entirely new. We weren't going to find the Yeti or an alien. We were going to be the pioneers for a new cryptid. We fully believed that this was going to propel us into the ranks of cryptid hunters and make us professionals. Completely unaware how young we were to be thinking of a career and how silly an idea that a professional cryptid hunter was a career path. There wasn't anything like YouTube at the time and we were far too young to figure out forums. Though tell a lie, Martin tried posting about our adventure online on a school computer, but with the terrible quality of our screenshot, plus pitching the idea of this cryptid with the eloquence of a 10 year old, we were less than welcomed and very quickly banned from the forum after being mocked. Our first taste of online culture. We didn't care though, the hunters didn't want a demand to be taken seriously. We wanted to earn it. This was going to be achieved through a magnificent plan to catch the cryptid for the world to see. Going through the sketches we saved, we even had plans for a foolproof cell to quarantine the creature, making sure to add notes on makeshift variables, like if it could affect electrical devices or if it could become ethereal. Though to this day, I'm sure a ghost force field doesn't exist yet. Our plans to catch it wasn't much better. They ranged from ineffective to plain idiotic. One plan was labelled Operation Snare.jpg. In this folder were sketches of loops whipping around a figure's leg, casting him upside down for us to find. The detailed plan involved laying one of those loop traps that hunters use to catch rabbits, the ones always featured in Looney Tunes episodes. In the cartoons, the traps always lay perfectly still and somehow snagged the unaware character by the leg and snapped them up, hanging from the top of a small tree. It was a great idea in our heads, but we had no technical knowledge, so we just ended up leaving poorly tied nooses scattered around the woods. I'm sure that wasn't fun for hikers to find. I have piles of videos of us trying to tie these nuts and testing them on each other. They were more like lassos, needing something to pull it hard to wrap its target. We figured this was what the tree was for, as the cartoons always had them pulled by thin trees. But then we couldn't figure out how they triggered. Looking back on the footage, we weren't the brightest bulbs in the box. And you can tell, even from a fraction of each video, we were happy. We also had Operation Pitfall.jpg, which was a drawing of a giant hole with a sad figure stuck inside and three more figures above, us, lording over it in victory. The idea was to make pit traps, like you'd see Team Rocket do in the old Pokemon cartoons. In the show, they somehow always manage to dig a deep, unclimbable hole in no time and conceal it in a way for unbeknownst travellers to fall in. What we didn't realise was how much work a hole was to dig, especially in a wooded area with many roots, dead and alive, binding a lot of the top layer of dirt. To document things, we propped the camera on a branch aiming down hoping to get a cool time lapse of the hole getting deeper and deeper. We got about a foot deep and barely a foot wide before giving up. I think one of our worst ideas was something we saw in those mystery show documentaries. Our plan was this. Operation Night Vision.jpg The sketch was of an unattended camera secretly filming a figure eating some bait from a bush. The idea was to set up the camera to film all night. Any motion detected would be picked up and we'd get it on film. 
all we needed to do was conceal the camera and leave out bait, so that whenever the cryptid would unknowingly take the bait, it'll get itself filmed. When discussing bait, as much as we wanted to use a dead animal of some kind, we were ten, so we used the closest thing, a pink bunny plushie. Another setback was that we didn't exactly want to leave our camera unattended in the woods, so we set it up in my backyard. When playing with a camera, we realised we had neither a motion sensor camera nor a night vision camera, but we tried anyway. When we went to check, we realised how ill-equipped we were. We only filmed part of the night, we didn't get anything usable and the plushie was gone, which was upsetting at the time. We figured an animal must have got it. So what we ended up with was about two hours of pitch black footage. We skipped through the video, but didn't give it much mind after seeing that nothing ever changed. Every day we spent trying things. When we weren't trying things, we were scheming. When we weren't scheming, we were laughing at the footage we got. We never got to try all of our plans, because our investigation was cut short. The headlines saved in my files were widely reported. It was an infamous case in my county. The headline stated that Martin had killed James in the woods. Each title was as catchy as the last. Each one was accompanied with a mugshot of Martin. Each shot carried a look of melancholy, almost unemotional. There were a lot of accounts, but if you piece them together, they all tell one cohesive story. Since starting this project, I've became obsessed. Each file I glimpse at brings back a mixture of memories and feelings. Each file I examine brings out interesting clues that we never saw as kids. Each file I study brings cursed tales. We had hours of footage piled up. At our young age, we never delved too deep into them. Patience and attention is a fleeting thing when you're 10. But now, I have the drive and motivation to really inspect the finer details of each file. And doing this, I've started finding some strange happenings. It started not long after the previous post. After I closed things for the night, I started hearing a strange rustling. I was obviously perturbed since I shouldn't have heard nature so clearly in the confines of my room. When I slipped off my headphones to try hear clearer, I practically slapped my forehead when I realised it was coming from the computer. While writing about the files I found, I had accidentally left the two hour night footage open. It was a quiet night, so I never realised it was playing in the background while I typed away, documenting my findings. I clicked on the background file as it still played out. Though the screen remained black, I could hear the clear sounds of movement. A shuffling, heavy with nature underfoot. As it came closer, it became more clearer. It wasn't hard to realise. It was footsteps. The last few frames of the file caught the lower torso of a person stepping into frame. It was obviously an adult, as looking back, we calibrated the filming height on us, kids. The only other movement on screen were the curled fingers of the figure in front of the lens as the clicks and rumbles rattled through the headphones, which indicated that whoever was on screen was fiddling with the camera. Then the video ended. Whoever it was had turned off the camera. As I stared at the option to replay the video, 
regret fill the pit of my stomach. If I had found this when I was younger, maybe things would have been different. Martin wasn't the most social kid, but to us, he was fun to hang out with. He often matched the mood of the room, which made him invisible to many, unless the energy got too intense. Martin had his limit for social energy, and it was very low. This made him so inoffensive that he never stood out. He was known as the quiet kid. Our entire group was, but Martin especially so. This made some people scared of him. The old adage of, the quiet ones are usually the crazy ones, made some people think poorly of Martin without ever knowing him. Sure, we'd find him doing weird things every so often. Once we found Martin talking to himself in weird voices, and another time we caught him burning pieces of paper in secret. We figured he was just practicing survival skills or something. Martin never cared what people thought about him though. He had us, and that seemed to satisfy him. Looking back, I don't think Martin was ever into cryptids like James and I were. He just went with a flow, and that flow just happened to be mystery hunting, though that didn't stop him from adding to the group. Martin was the first to veto especially bad ideas, ideas that skirted on the line of dangerous. He was also great at constructive input, something James and I lacked. In some way, he was the most rational out of the group. Maybe it was his detached outlook that gave him a wider perspective on our plans. It was one of Martin's ideas that was the last we ever tried. The idea wasn't very complicated. We never documented this one either. It more came from the top of his head. And since it never required too much planning, we just rolled with it. Maybe it was its simplicity which made it better than most of James and my ideas combined. His pitch was simple. James would stand in the middle of an opening in the woods, while Martin and I would stay in the bushes, hidden. From there, I'd take the photo if anything approached, and we would team up if things got too sticky. We put a lot of planning on the hiding side of things. Martin and I made what were essentially homemade ghillie suits. We taped a heap of foliage all over ourselves and found some old children's face paint to mix up greens, browns and black streaks on our faces. This worked surprisingly well. When practicing, James said he genuinely couldn't see us, despite being about five feet away. Martin and I pocketed our Swiss army set as well, both as a tool and as our protective weapons. Even though it's obviously frowned upon for kids to have knives, since we trekked the woods a lot, our parents made sure to teach us proper safety and trusted us to be responsible. While James stayed in the open, making sure to put on an act to look vulnerable, Martin and I muttered away to each other. He started a small talk to pass the time, but soon, he took this opportunity to voice his frustrations. It wasn't just petty frustrations either, it was frustrations of his life. He lamented about his inability to socialise, how he gets bullied despite feeling like he didn't deserve it, and worse, disturbing things about his home life. Details too distressing for a ten-year-old to hear. Above all else, the one saving grace he wanted was for him to be my best friend. But he felt he could never have that. Martin was essentially jealous that I was closer to James. He spoke of how he envied how close James and I were. That if he had a bond like that, maybe his life would be much better. I didn't know what to say. In some ways he was right, I was closer to James. We shared bonds over our mutual passions, our passion of mysteries, shared interest in cartoons, and our many inside jokes. Things that never organically came from Martin. The only way Martin was ever included in a joke was when he made himself involved. 
I tried to tell him I admired his qualities, that we were still close no matter what, and most of all, to not worry about that sort of stuff. But that plea fell on deaf ears, and soon he shuffled away. I tried to stop him, but he wasn't listening. This upset me. It's one thing to have a fallout, but this operation meant a lot to both James and I. If I had chased after him, James would have been left unattended. If someone was acting as bait and the backup left, if something were to happen, the bait would be taken. Even as a ten-year-old, I knew that was a bad idea. I made sure to stay around and be there for James, even if Martin didn't want to. Besides, I had the camera anyway. I had a job to do. But Martin didn't leave. In fact, he did the opposite. I watched with a very confused look, at first not knowing what I was looking at, nor what to do, as foliage started to move. A bush inched its way closer to James. I wondered if it was the cryptid we were after finally choosing to reveal itself. James never realised something was approaching. I was frozen in a fearful anticipation. Just as I realised what it was, the bush stood up and attacked James, completely catching him off guard and dragged him away. The only glimpse of something human in the bush was the painted face of Martin. I fled. I didn't know what to do. Nothing ever went wrong at that age. I wasn't equipped both physically or mentally to deal with something like that. When I got home, it wasn't long until I was questioned by police. I wasn't very cooperative, but eventually Martin confessed to everything. I was let off the hook, deemed to not have been complicit in the act. Martin took the full blame. James was dead, and Martin was locked away. That was a story that was officially reported, and that story was a complete lie. It's not easy living through death at such a young age. It matures you fast. In some ways, it stripped away my innocence. From then on, the colourful outlook I had on life had permanently dulled to a darker hue. Life doesn't magically fall back to normal at the end of each episode. Sometimes the heroes don't save the day. Sometimes, you just have to grow up. Something that triggered this desire to delve into my childhood hard drive was a hobby I picked up a few weeks ago. When the mood takes me, I like to walk the woods of my youth, though I no longer hunt cryptids. There's something nostalgic about these trees, untouched by civilization. They live through everything, no matter what petty happenings fall upon our, in comparative, short lives. There's a big difference between watching my old videos of us walking the trails and actually doing it. Blood rushes around your body, stimulating oneself to a dopamine high. The smells are euphoric, really bringing me closer to nature. The air is clean, no pollution to stain your breath. My friends are not here to enjoy these walks through time but I still carry them in spirit, living through the fond memories we forged in our youth. Though sometimes I wonder, do I really enjoy these walks? Because afterwards I ache. Time hasn't been kind to me. I don't enjoy my sinuses getting clogged up from all the pollen. I don't enjoy the views of nature as I once had. Instead, I'm often focusing elsewhere. 
I subconsciously keep a vigilant eye, scanning the area for something. I'm never relaxed. Sometimes I think to myself, am I tricking myself into going in the woods to secretly look for answers? The open clearing where the final plan went down has shrank a bit since my childhood. Overgrowth is slowly claiming back the free land. Eventually, it'll all be swallowed up, and the memories here will be erased by time. It's hard to remember which bush Martin and I laid in as we watched James before he disappeared. It's here where I sit down, close my eyes, take a large, deep breath through my nose, and let the memories take over and play in my head. The first lie of the story was that using James's bait wasn't the original plan. It was meant to be me. The pitched idea was for me to act vulnerable in the clearing, a spot that Martin had found some time prior, and for him and James to wait in the bush with the camera. However, even though it was Martin's idea, it was outvoted when we settled that I was the better cameraman and James was the better actor. I was the one who always used the camera, which is why I had all the files. So we never knew why he suggested things the way he did. But we soon rectified the plan to how we thought things should go, much to Martin's protests. We spent the day working on camouflage. We never had any references to real ghillie suits. We just spitballed the idea of concealing ourselves with foliage. Dressed in our best olive and green toned clothes, Martin and I stood as James dressed us in tape and branches. After a bit of face paint, we were set to completely turn invisible in the woods. The camouflage wasn't just good in our minds either. This was one of the few successful things we had ever done. If we stayed still enough, James couldn't see us at all despite us having a good view of him. This bolstered our enthusiasms, and we pushed on with the idea, confident that we'd finally have some success. James and I waited in the bushes, talking in our hushed tones. In the cartoons, characters could somehow talk to each other and never get seen, and we had the idea that we could do the same. We giggled at how funny it felt, watching our friend as he had no sight of us. The fun and games ramped on, as we slowly started to forget about the objective. Our attention back then was as bad as you can imagine. But suddenly, our conversation grinded to a halt when we heard a sound. Adrenaline shot through us, and Martin and I had the fleeting feeling that this was our chance. I tried to slowly pull out my camera, trying not to make any sudden moves, but something slowed me down. The sounds wasn't just heading in our general area, they were coming directly towards Martin and I. We looked into the whites of each other's eyes, this was our only way of seeing each other. It was our only comfort as our overwhelming confidence very quickly melted into a feeling we had never truly experienced to that point. Fear. Seeing each other was all we could do, lest we move and alert whatever was approaching to our position. I can only liken our comforting stares to each other as mentally holding hands, a comfort that settles tensions when you're young. The footsteps approached, creaking on twigs and leaves, each step was crunchier than the last as it got closer and closer. Another sound picked up above the footsteps. James had started acting out, singing la 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 la, in a way like he was purposefully trying to sound inconspicuous. The metaphoric, innocent whistling you see when hijinks ensue. Whether he was trying to play the part as bait or if he thought the sneaking sounds was us and he tried to play along, I don't know. 
The footsteps got so close as to almost brush past my head. I was facing away, but I could see Martin's eyes widen. I knew whatever it was, it was real. And whatever it was, it sent the fear of God through Martin. The last things we heard was all signs of subtlety leave as the figure, only inches away from me, let out an angry and frustrated grunt. The figure dashed towards James, and all too quickly we heard the high-pitched scream of true terror. We were kids. We had always felt invincible up until that point. When watching cartoons, no matter how bad things got, everything always worked out. In our heads, this was no exception. When Martin and I ran, we confidently felt we were going to get to safety and somehow James would reconvene, having an amazing tale of escape to share. We made it to a usual meeting point and we waited. We waited longer than felt comfortable. Then, dinner time rolled around and we knew we had to go home. At worst, we felt James had gone home, a little scared than how our usual play ended. I couldn't eat when I got home, and I was barely an hour into bedtime when my parents woke me. In a roundabout way, they asked if I knew what happened to James. I stupidly told them no, that I thought he got home okay. I said it not as a lie, but as a prayer with my whole heart behind it. I felt if I believed enough, he would be okay. A foolish dream. At this, my parents left in concern. It wasn't long until the police were involved. They questioned me, at first gently, then rigorously about what happened. My story kept the same, that there's a monster in the woods, a cryptid, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, something. We were hunting it as a group, we wanted to document its existence, that we ran when we saw the monster, and I thought we all made it out. Each time they asked, they always got the same response to their frustration. They talked about putting out a search that there was possibly a missing kid in the woods. But suddenly, the mood of the room changed. One of the officers got a call, and afterwards had the other officers leave. It came out that Martin confessed that he attacked James in the woods. He confirmed that he acted alone. Because of this, I was never deemed complicit in the case only considered a witness. He talked about his reasons, the reasons that became widely publicized and talked about. He became a local legend, a hero to those with a small voice, the fear that made people think twice about bullying others. Martin led some officers to the spot where it all happened, and they found traces of blood. After testing, it was revealed to be the DNA of James. I was confused. Why would Martin lie like that? Why did he take the fall? I was so young. I never fully understood what he truly did for me. He made it so only one of us was punished for our mistake. He took the fall so we didn't have to. Yet, I will never know his reasons why, because only days after Martin was apprehended, he was found dead in his holding cell. It was overwhelmingly identified as suicide. It's painful, living through such a traumatic event 
with no sense of closure. The police classed it as an open and shut case. Disturbed kid goes crazy, attacks another kid. When remorseful, he took his own life when detained. Though it's not a conventional case by any means, it was deemed to be over, no matter how much I protested things when I grew up. With age, I felt I had matured enough to articulate more about what happened. However, the police didn't want anything to do with it. They kept telling me I was wrong, that the case was proven to be over. What I think is that a closed case is a good case. It never looks good to reopen a case with the chance that it'll go cold. To them, it was over. But not to me. It wasn't over until I got my answers. And the only way I could was on my own. After going through many of the files on the hard drive, I found very little true evidence of the monster. The only real sightings I could find on my own was the first one that sparked our interest and the last two frames of the two hour night shot. Sadly, I'm only one person and can only study so many hours of footage. But there were still clues to me. I started to notice a pattern in the locations we visited. Though we often felt like we were going in random directions, Martin always led us in certain ways, no matter which way we went. Though from the footage alone, it was hard to tell if it was for safety or another reason. There were some spots we only ever went to once, never finding anything interesting. One of which was the time we filmed ourselves going deep into the woods, getting bored and heading back. This was the video where we found the few frames of the figure behind the bush. It dawned on me that we had never went back to that spot. I watched through the file paying attention until I found the timestamp of the sighting. From there, I scrubbed back, studying the route in reverse, making many notes on the key surrounding details and a few screenshots I saved on my phone of important landmarks. I went all the way back to the start of the video, hoping to find the starting off point. And lo and behold, the starting point was surprisingly easier than I thought. I recognized the area where I first clicked on the camera. It was a trail, not far from one of our dens, a common spot where we headed in an uncommon direction, something we often did. I mapped out the directions on a roughly drawn map and decided, against my resolve, that I was going to go on one final hunt. Dawn was cracking. Starting early, I made my way through the border between the shaded nature and the bright civilization. I crossed into the realm I would explore and wholeheartedly accepted my renewed journey. With James and Martin in mind, we once again went on a hunt. I followed my path both mentally planned and scribbled down. As kids, we set up dens as meeting points in case one of us got lost. They were safe spots to meet that we knew all too well how to get to. Things were quiet in the woods, an eerie reminder of my loneliness without my friends. At the den, there were still a few discarded items of ours, Long since degraded by time, I knew they were still there back then, but since I chose to never return to the woods after everything that happened, I never came back to collect them. Inside the backpack we hid were three figures, each of our favourite ninja turtles. I decided I didn't have time to reminisce and chose to move on. I pulled out a compass and started pitching my way through the foliage, 
stopping every so often to make sure I was on the right course. Every time I noticed a landmark from the video, or spotted a path we followed, my heart raced. My heartbeat was pumping as I charted my way to the goal. However, it wasn't from exertion. I knew my limits, and this was well within my means of fitness. No, it was from my nerves. I realised I was getting terrified. Though it wasn't the memories that haunted me, they were still fresh in my head like a never healing scar. It was the guilt. I finally arrived. I stood in the clearing where the camera span and picked up the sighting of the figure. I stared at the bush, triple checking all my saved pictures to make sure it was the right one. After a while, I realised I was just stalling, fearful of the anticipation. But in the end, I knew I had to push forward. For James. For Martin. I was going to try solve this. The bush was hard to traverse. It tangled and weaved so tightly that it was like a solid mass. This explained why the figure never went for us upon seeing us. Once I finally got to the other side, things looked different. The ground looked more travelled than the wilderness we were exploring as kids. The ground was pressed down in a repeated manner. This spoke to me one thing. This was used as a trail, and the ground hardened from a lot of use. I was apprehensive at this evidence of a presence, but I resolved to press forward further into the trail. In my head, I thought it would take a while of exploring, but it was terrifying how close I found something. In the middle of a man-made clearing was a run-down hut. It was apparent that the location was chosen because it was concealed from many angles, hidden in plain sight. The hut looked man-made, built from the wood of the land, yet nothing of it spoke professional quality. At best, it was functional. It looked empty, sparse of life, so I went to investigate. Upon closer inspection, the wooden facades were rife with rot. It didn't look fun to be near, let alone live in. Yet at some point, someone had. There was clear evidence of it. I creaked open the door with ease, a complete lack of security. By how well the door was put together, it was most likely due to a lack of knowledge. Upon the draft of the door swinging ajar, the smell that hit me was putrid. Layered in the dank rot of the wooden structure was an overwhelming sickly smell. I suspected discarded foods or a terribly placed toilet, but it was much worse. The smell was solely emanating from what looked like a makeshift bed, a loose frame of wood which surrounded the now dry and brittle leaves and twigs. Maybe it was soft, once. On top was what remained of my childhood monster. There was an emaciated figure rotting away on the bed. I gagged, the dichotomy of running away mixing with my desire for answers. I turned and took the last few clean breaths I'd be taking for a while and forced myself to step in. Whoever it was laying there was long since dead. The figure was curled into a fetal position, its arms wrapped around something. I had to find out what. I stepped closer, 
tears welling in my eyes from trying not to breathe, and the shock from seeing my first dead body. I inched myself to a distance where I could still breathe, but also see the full contents of the bed. And this is where I started to regret my pursuit for answers. Wrapped in a curled position, coddled by the larger figure, was a smaller one held in the same position. It was overwhelmingly clear that the smaller figure was a child. The last thing I saw before turning away was what the smaller figure was cuddling. In its grasp was a small plushie, rotted, but clearly it was once a bright pink, with long, bunny ears. It was the bait we left out when we filmed my garden at night, before the figure turned it off. No matter how much I tried to deny it, it was becoming clear that the small figure was James. Turning away, I tried to study the rest of the small room. All the walls were layered with paper, some handwritten, some printouts of pictures. They were pinned around haphazardly like that of a madman. Most of the pictures were hard to make out. Age had stripped away the colours, degrading most of them beyond recognition. There were many taken of the backs of heads. Some were of a moving figure, leaving them blurred. But the few that I could make out told the story of what they all were. One clear shot was of Martin, James and I in one of our dens, playing. They were all of us. I ripped them down, trying to see what this was all about. And behind the first layer, there were more. Us, younger. But never just Martin and James. They always included me. Then I found more. A picture of me alone playing in the yard. A picture of me alone entering the woods to meet James and Martin. A picture of me alone pouring myself a cup of water from inside my kitchen. This wasn't about us. It was about me. What scared me more was that the figure visited me where I lived. That it knew my house so well that it recognized when we left out a camera. But these were just the pictures. Craving answers, I turned to the writing. Like with the pictures, many of them were erased by time. Weather that had seeped into the room had warped much of the ink. From what I could read from the few I salvaged, was that everything in that hut were all drafts. Each one of them seemed to have editorial notes. To add a paragraph here, or to edit a misspelling. Some of them were addressed to Martin. They were strange letters that read like whispers from the devil. Trying to put them in order, they started off empathizing with Martin. They spoke of how they understood how he felt to be an outcast, but that life gets better. They spoke of how he shouldn't give up on being normal, that if he wanted, this person could help. They moved on to how they promised the world. They could erase the bullies, they could stop his parents being mean, they could end all his suffering. All he had to do was do as they said. There were hints of where he should go for answers, and to bring his friends, but never tell them. Each direction described eerily brought back memories of the sudden turns he made when we went on walks, a chilling flash of hindsight. The last draft I could find were details of a plan he was to suggest to his friends. A plan for me to stand in a clearing while James and him watched. This person promised he would make a monster appear for Martin to capture. 
He would be the talk of our group. No, our town. It would be that simple. It ended with a crude map from one of our dens to a place for this to happen, and a time, and a date, all of which were burned into my memories. It was the day James was taken. All of these letters always ended with the instruction to burn after reading, something that struck back to seeing Martin burning papers randomly when we met him. Thinking he was practicing survival skills now felt so naive. There was one draft addressed to me, a love letter. It spoke of how they cherished me, how I was the brightest star they wanted to stare at in dark nights. Twisted words that echo the love letter I received one Valentine's Day. The new meaning, leaving a putrid, sour taste in my mouth. The rest of them confused me. They were all addressed to my parents. They were words of malice, twisted threats to return what's owed. That they were a vengeful person and would never be separated from their destiny, all of which fell on confused eyes. No matter how much I read them, and which way I arranged them, they never made sense. There was a context missing. The only way I knew to get it was to confront my parents. The last place I looked was in a drawer, Inside was a camera which looked familiar. Seeing features I didn't recognize, I figured out it was a newer model of the camera I was given on my 10th birthday. The gifted camera that was accompanied by a note signed by the same name that signed all the letters addressed to my parents. A. Carlson. The last thing I found was an envelope. It was neatly placed on the table, which contrasted the insane scraps pinned around the walls. Now high on my desire for answers, I peeled it open. Inside wasn't a draft, but a fully written letter. It went on about how they lamented that they failed in their goal in life, that the one person they wanted got away. He got so close feeling near to success, only for the feeling to be stripped away when he realized he had grabbed the wrong child. He felt he knew the authorities would be upon him soon. It ended with a serene message that he wanted to go out of his own accord. The whole letter was an eloquently written goodbye. Strangely poetic words for such an insane person. I wanted so desperately to tell the police, to even distastefully rub it in their face for how they treated me, always passive aggressive in their responses and tone. But I chose not to. Not yet. Not until I have my answers. The last place to go is to my parents. For as long as I've lived, I've always been in my hometown, a small community that not many people even know exists. But my parents never used to live here. They moved just before I was born. They always told me they wanted a quieter life, and they found it in this remote little hamlet. My parents moved with a lot of savings, but they knew it wasn't smart to dip into saved money to live so my father worked a local job and my mum stayed at home to look after me. They figured it would be harder for them to both work, only to have to pay for a carer, so this was their best solution. My dad initially worked as an apprentice tradesman, but eventually he became a prolific worker throughout the town. If anyone needed something fixing, he was often the first to call. 
growing up, they adored me. I was a lone child, but I never felt alone growing up. After school, I played a lot with my father. He made sure he would always spend time with me after he finished work. My mother would care for me when dad wasn't around. Looking back, I don't know how he had the energy. He worked a grueling amount of hours, enough to make a 9 to 5, 5 days a week worker look like they were part timers. This was a sad necessity when you live in such a small place. You can't exactly become an entrepreneur when everyone is busy with their own lives and the local economy isn't exactly blessed with a heap of rich people. When I started properly making friends, my dad was initially chagrin at the idea of me spending more time with James and Martin. However, he quickly realized that I should be spending time with kids my age and he never wanted to be controlling. This was a theme they kept up to present day. They let me live my own life, something I thank them for, especially when I hear the horror stories of helicopter parents or uptight guardians. The town was small and in some ways not very progressive, so there were many elders that believed in a sterner way of bringing up kids. My parents weren't brought up locals and they recognized that kids should be kids. The families in this town are big. A lot of families have members that never want to leave. It's hard to describe the charm of living here, but you get a sense of community that makes you want to stay. As a result of this, some families are huge. James had a lot of cousins, and so did Martin. However, I was the odd one out. It was just my mom, my dad, and me. Growing up, I would ask them about this. Why didn't we have any family here? At first, they shot back with the obvious. They moved here, so family were elsewhere. The older I got, the more questions I'd add. If our family isn't here, where are they? Questions like these made them always fall to silence and redirect the question. Eventually, I learned to give up. Nowadays, they moved away. When I became an adult, they gave me the option to go with them or to stay in the hamlet. To their shock, I chose to stay. Despite the tragedy I lived through, this was still my home. I had no desire to leave it, yet. It hasn't been long, but that's how it's been. I've lived alone, living my small town life, and my parents are now city people again, living shoulder to shoulder in the bustling streets. When I contacted them out of the blue, they were pleasantly surprised when I said I wanted to visit them. Even until recently, I had never shown any desire to leave my town. Every time I saw them since we parted, it had always been them visiting me. So, when I suggested that I might visit them for a weekend, they were over the moon. It saddened me, knowing the real reason I chose to do this. I made sure to have a good day with them before digging and prying the truth out of them. We went out, had a great time, ate a meal, and settled with a movie. The day after, the mood was different. I sat them down. In my head, I had planned a grandiose speech about everything that happened, detailing all my hard work, the secrets I uncovered, the skeletons I aired out. But in the end, I looked at them. Unanimously, they were happy. I didn't want to take that away just to stroke my ego, or possibly hurt them unjustly. Instead, I brought up the subject in a lighter tone. At first, I asked about our family. Again, they turned at this, 
They danced around the subject, never revealing anything I never knew before. The same question, the same response. But it was exactly that. Always the same question. In that moment, I finally thought of the correct question to shoot. Who is A. Carlson? Immediately, the colour drained from their face. Whatever the answer was, it was serious. At first, they tried again to verbally dance away. Then they went back to their old story that it was a distant uncle they don't talk to anymore. However, I pressed them, and with a look of concern, they opened up. The tale they told was something I never expected. They opened with something no child wants to hear. I wasn't exactly planned. They had accidentally conceived and were completely unprepared for a child. My heart silently sank when I realised I was considered for an abortion, but they couldn't bring themselves to do such a thing. The option they settled on was to give me up to a couple that couldn't conceive and bless them with the family they wanted. That way, my parents could get on with their lives, and a wanting couple can feel whole. While my mother was pregnant, they started interviewing couples through some sort of agency to vet out who their progeny was going to go to. They eventually settled on a loving couple that stood out from the rest. The Carlsons. It was a husband and wife they were close as can be. They immediately fell in love with how similar they all were. My mom apparently had a similar face shape to Mrs. Carlson. They had similar hair colour, similar height. My dad was the spitting image of Mr. Carlson too. Because of this, they felt it was destiny for them to inherit the baby. Me. From then on, they had multiple interviews and the Carlsons aced them. They had a great life. Mr. Carlson worked as a local architect, and Mrs. Carlson baked custom cakes from home. They had supportive families that were on standby to help if they needed, and they had a nice house with a spare bedroom. It was a sad day when they found out they couldn't have a baby, but when they decided to scope out the adoption route and met my parents on the first try, they claimed it was a strong fate for this to happen. Though some people have quirks, my parents said there wasn't anything inherently wrong with either of them. They were perfect. Further into my mom's pregnancy, the strangest thing happened. My mom and dad fell further in love. The whimsical way they described it with some paternal and maternal feeling came over them one day. My mother was lying down, feeling a bit under the weather, so my father booked work off, refusing to take no as an answer, and spent the day with her, caring for her. Doing something so selfless for my dad, and feeling so cared for by my mom, made them realise maybe they should give the family idea a shot. They made plans to permanently move in together, and talks of marriage was already on the table. There was only one last loose end to tie up. The Carlsons. It wasn't easy to bring up. The Carlsons' hopes were high. They had an almost zealous enthusiasm about inheriting me. So, when my parents broke the news to them, it was understandable they'd be upset. Mrs. Carlson was shocked at first, yet was apparently understanding about the whole thing, even showing signs of happiness for my parents. Mr. Carlson, however, was a different story. He was irate. Through clenched teeth, he went off that I was to be his, that I had already been promised, that it was their destiny. He needed a child. It was fate that brought them together. He wasn't going to let that be torn apart so easily. 
From then on, the harassment started. It started small, constant calls and texts for my parents to reconsider, to have a child when my parents were ready, and that the Carlsons were ready now. He almost went through the five stages of grief, in denial, then quickly onto anger, harassing my parents to no end. He bargained everything, even offering things he couldn't possibly commit to. He offered everything in his life, his home, his car, his servitude. Mr. Carlson just wanted his kid. I want to say he got depressed and eventually accepted it, but he never got that far in the grieving process. Things only got worse. My parents refused to get into the grittier details, but knowing the things I found, I trust that it started to get ugly. This all culminated in my parents saving their money and secretly moving to the small hamlet where I was born. That made something click in my head. Why my parents, who never showed signs of truly being small town people, had moved and lived where I grew up for so long. They weren't looking for a quiet place to raise me. They were trying to get away from him. They heard that the Carlsons had divorced in their absence. Mrs. Carlson must have gotten sick of him, or worse, scared. And that was the last they heard about them, until my 10th birthday. When I got the present of a camera and a note, this hit them much harder than they let on. My parents were scared that he somehow found them, fearful of my safety. Above all else, the biggest thing they feared were the questions. They were happy that I took them at their word that A. Carlson was an estranged uncle and it was left at that. After that, they took the steps to officially file a restraining order against him. After showing a fraction of the evidence they had, it was very quickly put through. From then on, they never heard from him. And to this day, they haven't. To my parents, they succeeded. Afterwards, I didn't know what to think. I refused myself to bring up anything until I thought about how to go about this. So, I thanked them for the truth, and not long after, I left. When I got home, I picked a day I was free, packed a full bag, and went on another walk in the woods. With my blood pumping and fresh air pushing out the city pollution out of my lungs, I walked and thought. So much was swimming through my head. On one hand, they knew about A. Carlson the whole time, yet at the same time, they never knew what he was truly up to. They never knew how crazy he really was. Were they really to blame for any of this? Even now that I've had some time to think more, I've concluded that, no. I don't think they could have prevented anything. Mr. Carlson was crazy. He was oddly manic at the idea of getting me. He somehow saw a delusional salvation in me. And my parents did the best they could with what they knew to keep him away. My parents essentially threw away their lives to keep me, even going as far as losing contact with their family. Something I hope they reconcile one day. In the end, I also chose not to go to the police. To bring up the past would, in some ways, make both my parents and Martin complicit. Despite Martin doing everything he did, I don't hold it against him. In the end, he was manipulated. He was groomed. He didn't know he was putting James and I in danger. He thought he was doing good for himself and us. Call it naivety, but I never want to think of Martin as a bad person in all of this. It would upset my parents too. If there was an investigation, 
they would feel an immense amount of guilt about everything that went down. I truly believe they did their best. To imply that they failed would dampen their souls. I never want to sour any years of their lives after they did so much for me. Besides, Mr. Carlson is dead. James's family have had 10 years to mourn. My parents had the family life they dreamed of. Martin sadly atoned for his transgressions by his own hand. It's almost serendipitous. I've lived through this renewed journey, digging up old wounds, finding both metaphorical and literal skeletons of the past. I managed to solve what could be the greatest mystery of our town. But I'm choosing to never tell them. No matter how much I think about it, it's best this way. There's no use digging up the past anymore. To tell my parents, the locals or the police would only bring pain. Because it's over. It's time to bury it. I eventually made it back to the hut. The directions memorized only by me. I opened my bag and pulled out the reason I came back. A shovel. I buried James, hoping to give him the peace he deserved. It would have been sick to leave him in the clutches of that monster. Though only James was buried there, I held a vigil for Martin James in my childhood. On top of his burial, I left our childhood Ninja Turtle figures that I found, the totems of our youth, to be forever laid to rest together. Afterwards, I buried Mr. Carlson, not out of respect, but out of family duty. This was my family's dark past, and by burying him in an unnamed grave away from James's, I hoped to erase him from existence, only remembered by the trees. There was a good outcome though. I've walked into my forest of nightmares. I had ventured deep into the thicket of my past. I tackled the monster that resided in the oaks. And I came through to the other side, a new person. I finally had my closure. And in a way, that's what this was all about.